Right, so we're going to talk about drawing out the metal from an ingot form into a, an armouring form. Now I'm actually going to use pewter for this part of the demonstration, largely because it's much softer and quicker to work, and primarily because I don't need to anneal the pewter as I'm working it in the same way that I do silver. Now when you anneal silver, um, you need to heat it up until it's bright red, um, hold it there for a, a short period of time and then you can cool it afterwards, you can quench it. What this does is it sort of relaxes the metal basically so you can work it again. Because as you work the silver it hardens and if you carry on working it too long the silver will then split. So it's very important that you anneal silver fairly frequently. The pewter less so, so I can get away with doing quite a large demonstration without having to mess around with the heat. Um, I will show annealing later on though. So to start with, I've got this small ingot of silver um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, an anvil and hammer to draw it out and widen it a little bit. Uh, now, early medieval anvils tend to look something like this one here, um, often very small lumps of metal and with a one sort of flat face, sometimes a very small flat face, sometimes a slightly larger one. The large ones are a little bit more useful for this process. And the hammer can come in a variety of sizes but they normally um, they have one large square face, such as these, and then the cross pane on the other side, which is a, a thinner face. Now this is the face we're going to be using for drawing the metal out. So what I'll do to lengthen the metal initially is I'll take my ingot and I'll be hitting it across the direction to lengthen the ingot. So let's see how long it is to begin with. So at the moment this one's about 76, 77 millimeters approximately. So I'll proceed to hit it um, along about half of its length and this will thin the metal down but actually also lengthen it at the same time. So that seems to um, that seems to have worked quite nicely. As you can see it's an awful lot thinner than it was. And it's now about 85 millimetres long. So that's added a good sort of 10 mil onto the length, even just with that first working. Now with the silver, I'd definitely be needing to anneal at this point if I hadn't already annealed it to get this far. Um, but you can also, I mean, obviously I can continue to do this and make this armouring very long. This isn't quite enough to go around anybody's wrist, let alone mine. So I'd obviously work both sides in this, in this fashion. Um, but if, I, if and when I get to this, that stage, I can also widen the, um, the arm ring out as well to make it a broader band. And that's simply done by reversing the direction you're hitting it in. So this time I'll be hitting along the length of the metal and that will widen it out. Now no, first normally I'd use the other face to flatten the metal down. You can actually see this metalworking technique on extant pieces of scrap metal from sites. Um, Coppergate, for example, in York has got some very good examples of pieces of copper alloy with these sort of ripples on the surface where the, you know, the lump of copper alloy has been drawn down into something, perhaps to make you know, various pins, buckles and uh, you know, stuff like that. So let's have a go at hitting it crosswise. Oh, we should measure it first, shouldn't we? Let's see what's that. 9mm? Maybe 10? Something like that? See that's widened it already, it's thinner again. Well flat, flatten it off with the square face. There we go. And that is now 16 millimetres, 17 maybe. So we can see we've not quite doubled the width of it, but we've um, increased the width by quite a lot. Now of course the size of the eventual arm ring blank that you want is going to depend on a number of factors. The size of the ingot, you know, how, how long, how fat, how thick you cast it, whether you want to cast it into an ingot that's slightly closer to your original shape or whether you're just working from uh, stock ingots. This is the sort of thing that somebody who's done a lot of these will have you know, experience in doing. You know, they may be using, well, in fact, we know fairly certainly from archeology span that they're using some fairly standardized sort of units of metal and weight. 
So there may be different, um, you know, different forms that they're producing. We certainly know from the archaeological record there are lots of thin bands, fat bands. A lot of them have a, a flared centre in the arm ring. This can be done by a specific ingot shape with a flared centre, or it can simply be done by widening the centre out and then lengthening the sides to produce the exact same thing. So in lots of ways it's a redundant thing to demonstrate in too much detail because there are such a lot of variables involved. However, if we kind of do a um, time team sort of skip to the end moment or blue peter here's one I made earlier, we can actually sort of understanding how this process works and in effect you're just using a hammer and lots of hammering and battering and annealing to draw out the shape you want, we can skip to a modern piece of actual silver and show the rest of the process from here on in. I have here some modern sterling silver, uh, about one and a half mil thick, 20 odd mil wide and about 200 mil long. Um, it weighs about 60 grams. The original would actually be a lot longer because the ends would be formed out into thin wires which eventually get wrapped around um, the bracelet to enclose it as a, a full circle. But what I'm going to do is solder the wire on separately with silver solder which makes them a little bit cheaper and more affordable for reenactors and museums and things like that because um, obviously that's an incredibly lot amount of work to form it out of one piece. Um, it's actually the thing that I think is probably the most skillful. People are often impressed by the stamped patterns on the surface but actually that's fairly simple work. The real work to me is um, estimating the amount of silver, drawing it out, understanding just how much you need to use, particularly when you think that some of the complex arm rings in the Silverdale Horde actually have uh, zoomorphic terminals, which is to say animal um, head terminals, that have been forged out of the same piece of silver and then drawn down into wire as well. So just being able to estimate and judge how much metal you need is absolutely mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, and again, that's where the real skill lies to me. So, assuming that we've, you know, managed to do all that bit simply, we'll move on to the stamping pattern. Now, to start with, I incise two parallel lines down the centre of the, the bar I've got, and this will be the guide that I work to all the way through. These are very light, um, just scored into the surface, and a lot of it will be lost when we polish it at the end. However, you can often see these marking lines on original objects. Let's take a look at the stamps involved in actually um, producing the patterns on the Silverdale Horde arm rings. Now the primary pattern is produced by these stamps here. As you can see, they've got a, a flat bottom, this little wasted area followed by a little diamond or lozenge shaped section at the top. Now I made four gradating ones but actually primarily I used these two and just used these often only this one towards the very tail end. I'll explain more about how I use them when we get into the stamping part. Some of them also contain what is basically just like a screwdriver shaped line. All of them use this very very small hourglass shaped one. This is perhaps a millimetre on the face and was quite tricky to make. And some of them also utilise this round stamp I also often use a wedge cutting one like this, just for outlining and certain edges. And then that's basically it. Using those stamps, all the patterns are built up.